Good afternoon, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University. Thanks for joining another installment of our series, Understanding Our New World. And today we're delighted to be joined by one of the really impressive and important figures in American politics and government and, and strategic thinking right now, General John Allen. General Allen is the president of the Brookings Institution, one of the most important think tanks really in the world. And he comes to Brookings from a storied career. He was a uh, rose to be a four star uh, Marine general, um, incredible military experiences, including leading a NATO and US forces in, in Afghanistan, um, became a diplomat late in his career and uh, served as a special envoy for President Obama, dealing with the global coalition to counter ISIS, the Islamic State. So that was a hugely important assignment. He came to Brookings in 2015, became its president in 2017, as doing some really important work. And one of his particular areas of interest is artificial intelligence and is the co-author of an important book called Turning Point, Policy Making in the Era of Artificial Intelligence. So General Allen, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, it's great to be with you and be with the Institute there and, and be with the university. It's just terrific to see you, thank you. Great, and General Allen is joining us from Mount Vernon, his home there. So not too awful far from where George Washington uh, uh, started our started things going. So, well, General Allen, let's talk uh, just a bit about your military career. We could spend all day talking about it, but uh, I'm particularly interested. I know your dad, as I understand it, was a Navy uh, a vet, served in World War II and also Korea, and then you you uh, you, you entered the, the Naval Academy. So t tell me about your sort of early decision to enter uh, first the Naval Academy and then the, then the Marines. Well, I, uh, you know, my, my family's got a good bit of history in, in the military. And uh, uh, my father was always a very close friend uh, in addition to being my dad. And uh, I, I had enormous respect for him. And uh, he raised me in so many ways. It was like a, a leadership course every single day, being with my father. And uh, he, he started his career in the Navy in the late 30s and, uh, uh, and would find himself, even before World War II started, his destroyer uh, convoying a British convoy in secret, actually, because we hadn't entered the war yet, was torpedoed by a German U-boat. Uh, if you've seen the movie, the Tom Hanks movie, uh, Greyhound, the same destroyer, that was his experience, uh, except that Tom Hanks didn't get torpedoed. <laughs> um, and, and the thing that was interesting, he told me as I was growing up that one of the things that was most impressive to him was that in those days, the wardroom of that ship and most of the ships in the Navy, and the wardroom means it's the place that where the officers gather, every officer in the wardroom of most of the ships in our Navy in those days were Naval Academy graduates. And he was so deeply impressed uh, by a young enlisted, by being a young sailor on that destroyer, with the quality of those officers. He always said to me, if you, if you wanna go into the Navy, Naval service, you should go in through the academy. And, and out of respect for him, and out of respect for his opinion, um, that's what I pursued. So I enlisted uh, when I was 17 and uh, <clears throat> would go through something called the Naval Academy Preparatory School and uh, which is you know a year or so, and uh, and then went into Annapolis. Um, now the one thing I've, I've not understood is if, if, if for someone say entering Marines, could you go from um, say like the Air Force Academy in West Point into the Marines, or is there a specific uh, kind of movement from the from the Naval Academy to the Marines? Is there a special relationship there? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> well, the answer to your first question is yes. You can be uh, both a West Point graduate or an Air Force Academy graduate and come into the Marines or the Navy, but there needs to be a, a legacy dimension to it. In other words, your family need to, needed probably to have served in that service for long periods of time, but it's, it's exceptional. It's not, it's not frequently done. Um, but the Naval Service has always relied on the Naval Academy to produce both Navy and Marine Corps officers. So for many, many years, 16 and two thirds percent of any class at the Naval Academy could go Marines. Now they've taken that lid off and more can go now. Um, and I, as I said, I enlisted in the Navy. So I was a young sailor uh, at 17 and went to the Naval Academy, but I had always really been enthralled by the Corps. My, even my father's stories had early along his experience with Marines during the Korean War. 
uh, had enthralled me with the idea of being a Marine. <clears throat> and um, he never he never seriously thought I would become one, actually. And um, and I remember as, as I'm selecting the Marine Corps in the, my final year at the Naval Academy, uh, my father's sort of in shell shock because, you know, his his son is going to go in the Corps. And uh, I remember his his comment to me, look, son, if you'll go in the Navy, I'll pay off your Corvette and give you five thousand dollars. <laughs> I said, "Whoa, oh, wait a minute! What are you doing?" I said, first of all, is that your final offer?" And second of all, <laughs> but um, he died. I was in Bosnia at the time. Uh, he passed away. I was able to get to his bedside, but he never regained consciousness. And I was lieutenant colonel uh, when he passed away. My mother lived long enough to see me uh, as, as a four star. Uh, and of course, I never had any regrets, and they were very proud in the end that I became a Marine. Well, I mean, the Marines have to be one of the most iconic institutions in American life. So tell us what it's like to be inside the Marines. And I mean, to rise to a four-star general, I mean, good grief, that's, that doesn't happen very often. What was the secret? Well, um, the, the Corps, of course, is as old as our country, and uh, we have always believe that uh, we have a very special place uh, in the, the pantheon of our, of our nation, but also a very special place in the context of, of uh, the American people. Uh, we had a great commandant a few years ago by the name of Chuck Krulak, who used to say that Marines win battles and make Marines. Uh, the United States Army is the chain mailed fist of our country and it, it takes the war to the enemy, but the Marines as part of the Naval service can in fact influence actions and deter opponents to prevent us from going to war. If we have to, then the army's right there and the army would be great. But the Marines have always been at the leading edge of American influence, uh, partnered of course irrevocably with the Navy. Um, so it's, a, it's an elite force. And when you are committed from the sea uh, on, into a course of action, you know, there's no going back. So you better be ready and you better be tough and you better uh, have the capacity to, to get every bit of war fighting capability out of your formation as you possibly can. Uh, I was an infantryman, uh, very proud of that, uh, commanded rifle companies and infantry battalion, uh, would then later uh, command forces as the deputy commander in the Western desert in Iraq, and then would become the commander of the war effort in Afghanistan. Um, but when people say to me, what, was, what were the greatest moments you had as a Marine? I always uh, treasured my time as a captain. Uh, as a rifle company commander, you, you almost can't be closer to another group of human beings on the planet uh, than in leading you know, 175, 200 Marines and leading them through, in my case, cold weather operations or desert operations or amphibious operations, helicopter-borne raid operations. Um, and you become so close. And the spiritual tie that you have with those young Marines endures forever. And I still get emails uh, from my young Marines years, many years later. Hey, I'm Sergeant such and such. You remember me? I was a machine gunner. I'm right back. At, of course I remember you. Um, and those, those ties never break. Um, and their friendships forever, their ties forever. Um, it's hard to describe, but the, the camaraderie, that comes from hard training, that comes from a sense of being part of something bigger than yourself, uh, but also importantly, that comes from shared adversity. Uh, I would say to my Marines, you, you know, you're gonna have two families in your life, the one you're born into, but the one you serve with. And sometimes you're much closer to those with whom you've gone through the hell of combat than you'll ever be with the, those you're just uh, genetically related to. So it's a very special organization, the United States Marine Corps. Well, we'd like to have another session about just your, your military experiences because that, that, that's that. really remarkable. But, but you know, as you were leaving the Marines, you had the opportunity to, to assume some diplomatic posts uh, mm -hmm. as a, a Middle East envoy and then as the special envoy to President Obama for, um, to counter ISIS. 
Tell me about the, the kind of move from the military to diplomacy. Although, as I'm sure as a four-star general, you are effectively a diplomat, but did, was it like a different set of skills or a different, what was the transition like from being a military officer to being a, a, a diplomat? John, that's a great question. Um, you know, for some of my peers, when they retire from a position, say a four-star of some form or another, the uh, change can be pretty dramatic going off into the private sector of the civilian community. Uh, for me, it was actually quite um, it was seamless in many respects. First, Marine Corps, the Marine Corps has an ancient, ancient tradition of serving with the Department of State. Uh, so we, you know, we're in every embassy. We have a long tradition of serving with the Department of State. And we, we treasure our relationship with the Foreign Service. Um, and for me, I, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do when I retired. I retired and, you know, of course, as, as everyone does, you, you think about what comes next. I, I was thinking about what came next when I got a call from John Kerry, uh, who asked me to, because I had had some experience still on active duty on Middle East peace matters with the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, he asked me to come back into the government <clears throat> and to join him on his team uh, to try to affect uh, a Middle East peace process and the two-state outcome. Um, I jumped at that because there are few things to me that were more important really than peace in the Middle East. And at the heart of peace in the Middle East would be a negotiated outcome that would keep Israel secure and create an independent Palestinian state. So I, I was very honored to be asked. I came right back into the government. I had a, a staff, uh, uh, in the Pentagon. And although I was an asset of the Secretary of Defense, I worked directly for John Kerry. And I did that for some period of time. So because I had commanded the coalition in Afghanistan when I was still on active duty, that coalition had 50 countries in it. And so as you might imagine, dealing with the leadership of those 50 countries, either on the ground as leaders of their military forces, or dealing with the embassies in Kabul, or dealing with the capitals, the prime ministers, the presidents, the foreign ministers, ministers of defense. <clears throat> um, I was pretty current on diplomacy uh, at the time. And uh, my opportunity then to deal with uh, the Middle East peace was excellent. I had deep relations with Israel at the time, but I had also had deep relations with the Arabs in my service in Iraq. And I had great respect for the Arab people. And although the Arabs of Al-Anbar in Iraq are different than the Palestinians in terms of their heritage and lineage and tribal uh, uh, origins, the faith of Islam is still very important to them and many of their customs are similar. So I felt very comfortable uh, working between and with uh, Israel and the Palestinians. When I was asked by President Obama to uh, assume the role of the Middle East envoy, sorry, the uh, envoy to the global coalition to counter the Islamic State. Um, I, I had originally been asked after the Islamic State, ISIL, had invaded Iraq and, you know, the awful depredations that were being inflicted on the Iraqi people, the, the assassinations and the mass executions, it was terrible. And they had, in fact, overrun some of the areas in which I had served in the Iraq war. And my, the initial inquiry that came out of the government to me was, would I be willing to go back in and help the tribes organize for a counterattack? Uh, I said, yeah, sure, of course. I, Cause I, most of the sheikhs that were still alive of those tribes, uh, I'd either maintain contact with or had very good relations with them at the end of the, of my service in Iraq. And then there was no, nothing at all. I didn't hear anything back from the government. And um, at one point then I got a call from Dennis McDonough who was the chief of staff in the White House. And he said, the president uh, wanted you to come, uh, wanted you to be the special envoy to organize and work with within the global coalition to counter ISIL. I went right back into the government. And this time I was located at the State Department, worked again with John Kerry. We organized initially 65 countries. And here it turns out there was a lot of wisdom to that decision. Many of the people I was dealing with in putting together this coalition, I had been dealing with almost on a daily basis as a commander in Afghanistan because of a 50 nation coalition. So in pretty quick uh, order, we put together a, a 65 nation entity coalition, which has since grown to more than that. And uh, the intent was to create a, a political and a military coalition uh, to first stop the 
the uh, Islamic State. It was driving towards Baghdad. And that would have brought the Iranians in. It would have, it would have created a conflagration across the entire region. So we had to stop them. And we needed to stop them through a, a, the political activities and diplomatic activities of the global coalition, but also hammer them with a military coalition. And uh, uh, Lloyd Austin, who was just uh, sworn in as the Secretary of Defense, led that process on specifically on the ground. And uh, I think our, the combination of our activities and the leadership displayed by President Obama and the United States at this critical moment uh, was able to stop uh, the process and then roll it back. And we're not done. Uh, we're gonna be dealing with the Islamic State and Al Qaeda and other groups like that for some time. But I felt frankly, coming out of a four star slot, I felt very comfortable initially going to the Middle East for the peace process and then felt very comfortable uh, dealing with the political coalition of, of many states and, and spent a lot of time in the air going from one capital to another. We, we created a, a group that met periodically every six weeks or so in, in a particular capital, whether it would be in Canada or maybe Paris or uh, in the Middle East somewhere. <clears throat> so it was, a, it was a comfortable environment for me. I, I guess I didn't go through uh, culture shock uh, as some will do coming out of the military. I, I felt immediate purpose uh, in some pretty important missions, and uh, and uh, it helped the transition. So then, in, in 2015, you you uh, uh, accepted a position at Brookings, working on national security and intelligence uh, issues, and then uh, two years later became president. And I want to kind of pause for a second on Brookings because I, I mean I've been aware of it for many years, but as I was you know preparing for this interview, just a, a renewed respect for just its role in American society in terms of playing a, a key role on creating the Marshall Plan. Uh, you know, the, 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 the White House Budget Office in the 20s, the Congressional Budget Office in the 70s, um, you know, tax cut, 1986 tax cut, uh, response to the financial crisis. Tell me about what, how you see Brookings' role in, in American life and, and in kind of global affairs. Well, Brookings is probably the oldest think tank, continuously operating think tank in the world. And it, uh, its origins go back to 1916. It was uh, no surprise to you and uh, the audience. Uh, it played a, a role in uh, economic analysis, economic policy analysis. As the United States was stepping out onto the world stage, World War I is happening. We're not yet in the war, but it's clear, you know, the United States is going to have a uh, a much larger role on the world stage, but there was limited capacity inside the government to do the kinds of economic analysis necessary. And so Brookings picked that up. Um, and Robert S. Brookings would eventually, we'd eventually, the name Brookings would eventually be uh, uh, attached to the organization, but he would also start a university. Washington University in St. Louis was started by Robert S. Brookings. And we have still a relationship with, with that university. Um, and as time went on, uh, there became a very clear need for us to be able to do other things. <clears throat> and as you properly said, um, we played a role, the, the initial writings, the, the initial ideas and uh, policy memoranda for the Marshall Plan came out of Brookings. Uh, we provided, uh, I think, very important work on uh, the civil rights legislation, which would be landmark legislation in the Johnson administration. Uh, some of Brookings' initial work uh, would result in the formation of an organization you've heard of called NASA. Um, and so we've, we have been uh, present at the birth of many crises, and, uh, and I think we've provided uh, good service. You know, the institution tries to, and I think we're pretty successful at it, tries to do good is, is our effort. Uh, when I became uh, president of Brookings, I said that it was my intention that the institution should help the president to govern, not a particular president, but the chief executive, commander in chief, to help the president and, and his or her administration to govern and help the Congress to legislate. And if through policy analysis, we can provide for those two things, solid, sound, principled, values-based governance, and the same for supporting the Congress in legislating and creating the body of laws on which this, this republic relies, then we will have done good service. And, and that's our objective. Uh, as I said, we're the oldest think tank. Um, 
but we also have international roots as well. Uh, we are partnered with many think tanks around the world. Uh, I've already this morning had a conversation with uh, the leadership of one of our countries in uh, in Europe, uh, several conversations already today about uh, the, the NATO summit that's coming up. Um, I had a conversation very early in the morning. Uh, it, it, time zones, of course, are tyrannical um, uh, on issues associated with China. We have a China center at Brookings. We have a China office in Beijing. So we are not just uh, a center or a uh, think tank that, uh, that focuses on domestic policy. Uh, we're deeply engaged in international policy as well. well. I want to talk about your specific agenda, but I want maybe a, a broader question. And it, I, it, it's just th th over the last four years, I mean, much has been said and written about the, uh, the kind of uh, the disappearance of facts and the skepticism about expertise. And how is it, you know, for, for a group of scholars who are dedicated to rigor and careful analysis, you know, it must be difficult to operate in an environment in which those values, which have been so central to our cover, to our government and our way of life, were kind of pushed aside. Tell me about just sort of the broader challenges of these last several years. Well, it was, it, you'll not be surprised to learn it was enormously challenging. Uh, we have, I think, been very uh, comfortable in the aftermath of that administration by being able to look ourselves in the mirror and say we never compromised our values. We never compromised our principles. Uh, doing good was always foremost in our minds. And when you pursue analysis and research that is fact-based and data-driven, then your conclusions bring you about as close to truth as you can possibly be. Now, eventually other analysis may take you in another direction, but it's not because it, there wasn't, it wasn't based on truth. And the problem, of course, has been that there has been a decay uh, in uh, both the willingness to uh, speak truth and also the willingness uh, to produce truth through analysis. So, you know, biased analysis has been something that we've seen a lot of. Um, you know, and what we attempted to do at Brookings was either to develop original policy recommendations based on our values, based on, on uh, nonpartisan, um, evidence-based, data-driven analysis that could either stimulate, use our policy analysis and recommendations that could stimulate a new policy, or we would uh, have something to say about a current policy. And, and frankly, under the Trump administration, we had a lot to say about many of its policies that were, that were not based in fact, they were not based in good analysis, they were not based in principles or values, they were not based on human rights. And that was the thing, those things kept us on our forward, forward foot the entire time uh, we were in that administration. And we were never going to relent uh, on our commitment, ultimately to doing everything we could uh, to further truth. You know, people can have differences of opinion, but you can't have different facts and facts are truth. So for further truth and not stray off of those and hold fast to that. Uh, because in the end for us, it was all about human rights. You know, it was all about a you know, fact-based uh, data-driven analysis from which then credible uh, responsible leadership can then move forward with their decision-making based on the policy analysis and the policy recommendations that we offered. So it was, it was challenging, very challenging in the last four years. Uh, but I, as I said, in the morning, when somebody from Brookings gets up and looks in the mirror, you know, we're pretty comfortable with uh, uh, where we were during that time and where we are now. At this counting, uh, about 19 or so people from Brookings have now gone into this new government. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's not because of a particular partisan position that we took on things, not because, as people will say, we're a democratic think tank. We absolutely are not. Um, but the quality of the analysis that we have done, the quality of the policy recommendations that we have uh, put forward um, have been so important that uh, people from Janet Yellen, who has just been sworn in as the Secretary of the Treasury through a whole raft of individuals going to both domestic and international policy positions from the National Security Council through the State Department and Department of Defense and Commerce um, uh, and Health and Human Services. I mean, we, we had the capacity during the last four years to generate some very serious policy analysis. 
that has created a basis of expertise that is desperately needed right now in this administration, which is beset by challenges that we have never seen intersect so immediately for any single president. So they need help. And if we can help them as an institution or we can help them uh, through individuals, uh, we're ready to step forward because that's our job, help the president and help the Congress. And that's what we wanna do. Well, General Allen, I mean, you have, you've outlined, I think four presidential research priorities in which you want to you know, focus intense effort and, 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 and resources. And the first, I want to walk through them, and we can talk about them for a couple of minutes. I mean, the one that strikes me, I mean, the first one you say is the future of the global middle class. And just linking that to basically the, the functioning of democratic government. Right. Expand on that. Well, a couple of things. First, as a commander in the Marine Corps, uh, it was always uh, so wonderful to see the capacity of the young Marines, and then as I became a joint commander the, of our troops from all the services, uh, to interact with such uh, camaraderie, regardless of race and gender or faith. Um, and, and that capacity to me was, an, was, uh, was what we should all strive to have in evidence in this country. But the fact that it doesn't exist routinely in this country uh, has created uh, both economic, socioeconomic problems. It has created problems with race. It has uh, created issues of uh, geographic mobility and geographic, the haves and have nots, which is not a good term, frankly, but uh, we have seen such inequality in this country in so many ways. It has created in and of itself, John, a, a political momentum that left to itself could produce a Donald Trump. And from my perspective, uh, you know, seeing young Marines being willing to get up off the ground under fire and move forward with a black Marine on one side uh, and an Asian Marine and a native Marine and a white Marine, and they didn't care at all about those differences. They all went forward together and some of them were killed. Yet they would go home to find that their homes had been foreclosed. Uh, their families were out on the street or they went home to massive continuous inequality or to racism or to disadvantages in the tribal areas. And to me, that was, and it remains heartbreaking that we can't provide for all of those individuals, the kind of equity, social justice um, that this country is based on. This country is based on that promise. And so my number one objective uh, the first presidential research priority was to undertake the policy analysis necessary to support the future of the American middle class and by extension, the global middle class, because the global middle class has expanded enormously. And in many respects, it's, ex it's expanded enormously because of American post-World War II and post-Cold War leadership that created a community of nations that was based on the rule of law and a, a rules-based system. And while there have been you know, catastrophes in terms of, of uh, civil wars and terrorism and, and wars in which we both fought and started, sadly. Overall, global poverty is down and the growth of the middle class increases and the growth of the middle class creates stability. And it also uh, creates the capacity for, for the reduction of, of global poverty. So, my expectation or my desire was to create an environment at Brookings where the first presidential research priority is about repairing the difficulties experienced by our middle class in order to improve uh, the, the lot of the middle class, to reduce inequality, which has played out so dramatically in our politics. That was, that was my first intent. Well, uh, a second one uh, deals with the, the, the world of, that you know well, artificial intelligence and emerging technology. And I want to read a sentence from your annual report, which I think frames the issue pr pretty nicely. It says, um, artificial intelligence and other emerging technology, technologies will be the most transformative influence of the 21st century, bringing both great benefits to society, but also posing great risks when used for malign purposes. They are also altering just not how we live, but the very essence of governance. 
uh, you're obviously an expert in artificial intelligence. What are you trying to accomplish in this objective, this research? Focus? Well, a couple of things. Uh, in the 20th century, uh, much of what defined our capacity to do good uh, in the world, uh, and much of the uh, many of the determinant factors was was based on geopolitics and military power. Uh, in some respects, uh, the U.S. Soviet or the Western Soviet uh, Cold War really was an existential, potentially thermonuclear conflict. Uh, and of course, eventually the Soviet Union would collapse for a whole variety of reasons. We could talk about in another conversation, but it would collapse for a whole variety of reasons. And the Chinese watched that very closely. Uh, and they, because they always recognized that the Soviet Union, while it was a military giant, was, was an economic Lilliputian in many ways and was never gonna be able to compete with the West. And they saw that. And as the Chinese have gained power, and I don't wake up every morning thinking that we're gonna to go to war with China or, with, or even that we need to go to war with China, but the, but the Chinese have become quite technologically advanced. And so many of the determinant factors for geopolitics in the 21st century will be based on technology, not on thermonuclear arsenals and not on the sizes of navies, although those of course will play in considerations but it will be the capacity to exert influence in many respects through uh, economic power. And that economic power will be based in many respects on technology. Um, and, and there are very few technologies that we have encountered uh, in the, uh, just in the modern era, this is the fourth industrial revolution that we're in, which is about artificial intelligence. There are very few technologies that are so transformative as AI. Now, AI, has come on the scene uh, it, with, with such a vengeance, if you will, and I mean that in a positive sense, over the last several years because of really three things. One is uh, computing power. And while artificial intelligence as a concept existed decades ago, both a theory and then a concept, there was never really the kind of computing power that we needed in order to work the out mathematical algorithms necessary and the data, which is also necessary to train the algorithms in order to have true uh, artificial intelligence. And I'm not talking general intelligence, I'm talking artificial narrow intelligence. But the, the changes that that has brought, when, when you wake up, John, in the morning, when I wake up in the morning, by the time we go to bed at night, we will probably have encountered multiple systems throughout our day where in some form or another, artificial intelligence will have been at work. It is just the beginning. And artificial intelligence will, in many respects, define the future of transportation, driverless vehicles. It'll define the nature of what's going on inside your vehicle. Uh, your car today, if it's uh, a brand new car, is perhaps less a car than it is. It's a rolling information system. And that's because of artificial intelligence and the capacity through computing power to use the Internet of Things to move information quickly, to compute against that information, and to help you make decisions. It'll help in healthcare. It'll help in finding a, a solution uh, in terms of uh, immunology to the kinds of vaccines that we need. It, it will help in education. Education can become a profoundly different experience <clears throat> where it used to be about teaching. Now it'll be completely about learning. And of course, we'll have to help our teachers to be able to embrace the changes associated with artificial intelligence that comes from uh, virtual reality or partial. Uh, reality uh, in the classrooms. So it, whether it's transportation or smart cities or healthcare or the financial uh, sector, artificial intelligence is going to be one of the defining focuses of transformational or trans, yeah, transformational technology of the 21st century. And if you looked at the book, uh, there's also a dark side to this as well. And that is artificial intelligence will have <clears throat> enormous capacity uh, with respect to military and security capabilities. And uh, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about that. The, the reason that we wrote the book, and I, I didn't, I promise you, I didn't bring it because I was going to be on TV. I <laughs> have it on my desk here. and I pulled my notes out of it. The reason we wrote the book is because traditionally, uh, as new technologies appear in our world, uh, the policies that govern people's rights and privacy and uh, to ensure that the, the, or the technology is, 
is fairly and legitimately and equitably applied in the communities, those policies lag and they can lag for years. And often it's as much as seven years between a new technology and the policy regime that's necessary for it to, to play a productive role in society. And our view is in this book that artificial intelligence is so transformative across so many of the sectors uh, of our uh, human experiment that we have got to get into the business of policy formulation right now to ensure that artificial intelligence is used for the good and not, not because in an unconstrained environment, those who are uh, exploiters of the technology can use it for bad. And let me just very quickly read the dedication in the book because we, we thought about this. <clears throat> this book is dedicated to our youth into whose hands we have placed the full potential of artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies. It is our most fervent prayer that they are guided by the light of good in wielding these technologies for the benefit of all humanity. That's really important because if we get this wrong, it can go badly wrong. If we get it right, it's transformative in the human existence. Well, I did spend some time with your book and I found it really important in terms of just getting a basic grounding in the concepts, which I was unfamiliar with, but also just some of the really specific uh, uh, applications in healthcare, education, urban living, et cetera. So I would strongly recommend, uh, the, the, and, and this would be a wonderful book, I think, for policymakers who just need to have sort of a fundamental grasp of the concepts before exactly making decisions on regulations and so yeah. forth. General, the, the, another priority you list is American leadership in the 21st century. And I want, I, I, it's rare that I read an annual report and come across a sentence that almost puts me on the floor in terms of just really nailing something powerful. And you say, this is in re, re, discussion of COVID in the context of American leadership. And you say, the COVID-19 pandemic and the U.S.'s poor response is one of the most profoundly influential developments in the last hundred years. Um, and while it will take cooperation and action from all countries, American leadership will be essential to solving this public health and economic crisis. So play off of both the sort of broader American leadership challenge, which, and you define saying it's just not the US government, but it is American society and it's many leadership L levels as well as institutions. So talk about American leadership and then also connecting that to, to COVID and how the absence of it has been so devastating to our country. Well, if, if, if our listeners today uh, are tuning into the news every night and we, we hear the challenges that this new administration is facing as they grasp the enormity of how badly the last administration handed off the COVID response, uh, the, our viewers shouldn't be at all surprised uh, at, at, at the uh, failure. Uh, and I make the distinction, and I've made the distinction for, for some time at Brookings, that there's a difference between U.S. leadership, which is the, the official leadership of the government, and American leadership. And in the last administration, from my perspective, there was a you know, pretty substantial failure of U.S. leadership. Uh, it became, in, in many respects, transactional. Uh, make America Great Again didn't turn out to be so great. Uh, and America First didn't make us America First. It made us in many respects around the world America alone because we really alienated many of our partners. We went from being a, a, a nation where multilateralism was inherent in our foreign policy and in, and in the intercourse with nations, multilateralism, because all of us are better than one of us, to transactionalism and unilateralism bilateralism, where uh, we not only decided to deal uh, bilaterally, but we, we scorned our allies. And in many respects, we uh, lifted up uh, illiberal dictators and authoritarians. Um, and that, that, in many respects, characterized US leadership in the world. And so for me, uh, American leadership was about people like you, John, and people like uh, the, the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute. It is, it's representative of, of values-based principles of American leadership. And although we may not find that there's a, there's, it is synchronous, American leadership and US leadership, certainly in the last administration, 
the, the world community still benefited from strong American voices that stood for human rights in the world, strong American voices that stood uh, for uh, technological development, for the good of all humankind, strong American voices in support of NATO, for example, and our bilateral relationships around the world, uh, even when the US didn't. So when the crisis started on COVID, uh, and taking a, just a page out of my own book, I, not about me, but I'll just take the page out of my own book, when the Islamic State exploded on the world stage, and it's now relatively small and limited way compared to COVID, <clears throat> President Obama, through Secretary Kerry and some other folks, called for a global coalition. And in a period of just weeks, 65 nations and entities threw in with American leadership to create a global coalition that beat back one of the most horrendous uh, jihadist terrorist organizations on the planet ever. And I know a little about Al Qaeda. I know a little about the Taliban. I know a little bit about these guys, as bad as it could be. American leadership could have done the same thing as COVID began to explode. And rather than to reach out to our allies, and they don't even have to have been allies, to reach out with nations with a common interest to solve this pandemic and organize a global effort to develop vaccines. And very importantly, as we develop the vaccines, ensuring that not only those countries in largely the developed North have access to the vaccines for the population, but we take care of everybody who can't. We take care of the developing countries as well. We take care of those countries in the global South, where by the way, when it gets hot up here, the vaccine's gonna to go to the south and it's gonna reverberate back and forth over the equator for years if we don't get organized. The United States failed in its leadership to organize that global coalition to have the strategic global vision to identify the disease, to go after the therapeutics necessary to heal us if we're in the hospitals, to go after a vaccine, a vaccine that will create longer term societal healing, but not just for the rich states, but for all of the populations on the planet. And no one else has done this. No one else could have done this. The United States brings two things to every great strategic challenge on the planet. One is global convening power. When the president of the United States says, let's come together, people pay attention. Not everybody will come, but many will. And the other is strategic reach. And I'm not talking about strategic reach of B-2 bombers and intercontinental ballistic missiles. I'm talking about the strategic reach of American influence and American diplomacy, and the American economy, and American science. I'm talking about those kinds of things that really matter to the future of all humanity. And we had the chance for a global convening at the beginning of this, but the president just denied it and then lied about it. And we had the potential through our reach to organize a synergy of international activity and actions. Um, and we're dead by the hundreds of thousands of now. So there's US leadership and there's American leadership. And happily last Wednesday, um, we began to see the earliest glimmerings of uh, glimmer of uh, both of those operating uh, in a synchronized manner. Well, General, you've written, uh, just to, to go on COVID for a second, I mean, you've written uh, very powerfully in the Atlantic about the importance of creating a sort of a 9-11 style commission to both, uh, you're saying we need to solve this problem, and that's, uh, that's, that's huge. We also have to figure out what the heck happened, because um, there are going to be other diseases, and there are going to be other pandemics, and whether it's a flu or whatever, and we need to figure out, you know, we don't need to kind of reinvent um, you know, this response each time something springs upon us. Tell us what you think that such a panel could do. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's going to have to examine the, the entire spectrum of factors that were at work here. For example, um, what was it that created the opportunity for this pandemic to explode? You know, was our, was our capacity for global uh, uh, surveillance uh, disease surveillance, was, was that ready? Were we ready to have the kind of surveillance necessary for this pandemic and certainly for future pandemics? Second, when we had the sense that this was coming, 
Uh, what decisions, and this isn't going to be about Donald Trump. I mean, it, it'll end up inevitably being about him, but I don't want it to be, this conversation doesn't need to be about him. But what, where did we fail? Uh, did we anticipate that this would come? Uh, and if it did, what kinds of decisions did we make first to try to block its entry into the country? Second, as we began to see the population starting to suffer, what actions did we take <clears throat> to equip the public health service uh, or to equip our, our public health capabilities across the country to begin to deal with this. And because we didn't take really a, a national approach, a strategic national approach, uh, we couldn't really uh, allocate the kinds of, for example, just PPE. Did we have enough PPE? And as we began to find ourselves under duress, what did we do to try to create the amount of PPE necessary, personal, uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, masks, gowns, gloves, what, what did we do both to uh, marshal the PPE that we have and send it to the hotspots that we should have been monitoring to help them, but we didn't do that. We didn't provide national leadership. And because we didn't do that, we had governors going out to try to buy their own PPE and bidding against other governors and finding ourselves in a bidder's war of one state against another or one city against another uh, in terms of uh, you know, mechanical devices uh, for the, the purposes of uh, dealing with the resuscitation uh, and the intubation of the, uh, uh, of the uh, patients in the hospital, uh, the therapeutic uh, research necessary to develop what would eventually become remdesivir uh, and some of the other monoclonal uh, capabilities. Uh, we, we didn't take a national approach in that regard as well. The, another dimension of it was that uh, the, the exposure of our more vulnerable populations largely went uh, first unrecognized and then unserved so that our black, brown and native populations suffered enormously uh, from the, uh, the outbreak. And then our frontline workers, whether they're health workers, uh, healthcare workers in a uh, uh, senior's home uh, uh, or in a hospital, or the Amazon delivery person. We, we didn't really recognize what the challenges would be for them. So look, we don't need to invent this again. We should take the time to do a nonpartisan, fact-based uh, accounting of all of these areas uh, that were revealed as either deficient uh, in terms of our preparation, uh, deficient in terms of our uh, having stocked the strategic stockpile, we should never permit that to occur again. When we begin to continue to uh, build the machines and PPE necessary for the next pandemic, we should fill the strategic stockpile first and then be prepared immediately in the event that there's a crisis to activate the Defense Production Act, which the president activated but never really implemented it. And that we were so late in the process right now, President Biden is already uh, activating the, the uh, Defense Production uh, Act uh, in order to produce at a very high level of production the things that we need to, to get over the curve. <clears throat> so whether it was from surveillance to development of the therapeutic and its distribution to develop of a vac development of a vaccine and its distribution, I think every single day we hear about another catastrophe with regard to uh, uh, vaccine distribution. Uh, to what we have learned about our most vulnerable populations, both in terms of routine health care, but also how susceptible they were to the ravages of this disease and how we need to take care of them starting today so this never happens again. Uh, to, uh, as I said a few moments ago, what we could have done very early in this process uh, to develop an international approach to this where we could be as a community of nations far farther down the road in dealing with this than we are right now. We're still, uh, we still in many respects, the countries have turned inward. They're very inward focused. We've not had the opportunity to create the, the global uh, approach to these many different things, uh, which we could, which could have uh, created a different outcome for us. You know, for example, we, as I said, we have ties with China. Uh, Brookings has ties in the context of, uh, we have a center there and, and we've done policy research back and forth. There were Chinese sending Brookings PPE, which we then gave to local hospitals. 
when those hospitals couldn't get PPE through any American system. So there is a lot, John, that has to be studied. And it's, it's, it's not about the president, although it will end up being about the president, but it's not about the president, it's about what we can learn. And there's some things we can learn right now with a commission that can fuel how we continue to deal with it. But very importantly, uh, what organizational, what bureaucratic processes in our government need to be better organized, for example, at the National Security Council, uh, where there had been decisions made in the last administration to dismantle certain surveillance capabilities for uh, pandemic diseases and certain exercise routines that could have had us better, far better prepared. So there are bureaucratic issues, there are medical issues, there are uh, healthcare issues, there are social issues, there are economic issues, uh, there are international issues, all of which must be studied, analyzed, and recommendations put forward for legislative relief if necessary, or policy formulation if necessary, or organizational change if necessary, in order for us to be ready for the next one, because the next one is coming. With climate change the way it is, and the, the global warming and the northern migration of, of potential tropical diseases, just get ready. There's the, these are going to be uh, uh, in our future, and we cannot be so unprepared for the next one. You know, we're going to pass 225,000 dead this week. Uh, wow. I, I said two. I'm sorry. 425,000 dead this week. That's more than all the dead in World War II. Um, and it's less than a year. It's less than a year, John. We can't permit something that large, that grotesque to go unstudied so that we can wring out of that study every possible lesson learned to protect the American people and the global population from the next one. Well, General Allen, another one of your research priorities um, triggered off of the events of last summer, and it focuses on racial justice and equity. Of course, Brookings has had many programs related to this, very active and important programs. But tell us how you decided to, to kind of intensify your work on, on this realm of, of problems. Well, you've accurately said, John, that we have been doing this for some period of time. Um, part of it was associated with the middle class initiative. Uh, but one of our great researchers, Camille Bousset, had been uh, conducting uh, uh, a long-term research initiative on race, uh, prosperity, and inclusion uh, with the idea of doing the kinds of analysis necessary on discrepancy and inequality in our society uh, from which then policy formulation could help to benefit decision makers in dealing with this. Um, just as a side note, I was also on the Homeland Security Advisory Council, and I was asked to co-lead a committee, subcommittee, uh, that studied targeted violence against faith communities. <clears throat> and it became clear to me, as I did this, uh, that the, uh, the white nationalist, white supremacist element of our population, which in in its most extreme form takes the form of the Boogaloo boys and the Proud boys and the Oath Keepers and the Klan and the Nazis. They have made life hell in America for many of our religious communities, in particular the Black uh, Christian communities in the South, burning the churches to the ground, terrorizing the congregations. Same with the Jewish communities, same with the Muslim communities, same with the Sikh communities, Hindu communities. And it was, it was very clear to me as I returned to Brookings from that process, and we issued the report that we did, that Brookings needs to become as much attuned as we were on these matters, needs to become even far more attuned to the issues of, of uh, systemic racism, inequality, and social justice. And just as we were beginning to begin to put that together, the terrible tragedy of George Floyd's death occurred. And then America went through a moment of uh, national reckoning. It was long in the coming. Uh, it was probably long overdue. Uh, and the frustration that grew in the streets of America over this hundreds of years of unsettled social need for social justice was exacerbated by the policies of the federal government. Uh, both in terms of how it was perceived and also how the federal government either wasn't willing to take the steps necessary 
to begin to embrace the reality of the Black Lives Matter, et cetera, et cetera. But also uh, that brief moment, and I wrote about this in the Atlantic as well, that brief moment when it looked like the president was seriously considering using federal troops on the demonstrators across the country who were exercising their First Amendment rights to demonstrate against this long-term horrific condition of systemic racism. That to me was the beginning of the indicator of who this president really was. And it, it played out on the 6th of January, just a couple of weeks ago. So we have embraced this as the, what we call president, presidential research priority of on race, justice, and equity. And we're writing a great deal about it right now. And it, it, it's everything from helping the black community to understand uh, its personal and societal value, which has been almost systemically undervalued for generations in this country. If we were to value black worth and black property at the level that is that white value or white wealth and white property is valued, uh, evaluated, it would be hundreds of billions of dollars more. Yet it has systemically not been. And so it's everything from that to the issues of uh, uh, criminal reform, criminal justice reform, uh, to, uh, I've already addressed this in some respects, the issues associated with the vulnerability of our uh, black and brown populations and our native populations <clears throat> to the ravages of COVID and their distance, frankly, linear distance and societal distance from the remedies necessary for them to be treated in the same way as the white population. These are all things that we are embracing now. We're writing about it, we're talking about it, we're meeting about it. <clears throat> And I've been on phone calls where some of our scholars talking to governors or mayors uh, have really helped in the, post pro in the process of post COVID policy formulation to begin to deal with the matters of systemic racism, particularly as it relates to the, the uh, nearly desperate situation that has befallen many of these vulnerable communities and frontline workers both who have become unemployed in large numbers because they are frontline workers or have become sick in large numbers because they are frontline workers. We've got to do better as a country and Brookings has embraced this as one of our central missions. Great. General, we've had a couple questions emailed to us and I wonder if we could touch on them and then, uh, uh, and one of them actually plays off of just some of your comments or your comment on January, pertaining to January 6th. Bill from Chicago asks about, uh, just your reflection on that event and what it tells us or what tells all of us about American society. And I, I would just add to people that you wrote a powerful essay on this in the foreign policy as all, and, and also wrote a powerful essay in early June on um, the events at Lafayette Square. So play with, respond to that question as you can, General. Um, well, it was one of the, yeah. <laughs> Served in Iraq, served in Afghanistan, um, served against the Islamic State. Uh, and in my entire time, uh, 42 years in uniform, and then three more years as a diplomat, 45 years. Uh, while I served overseas and in several wars, um, and I always swore every promotion uh, that I would support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. For me, the domestic thing was sort of interesting, but I never really worried about it. Uh, I always worried about the foreign piece, the Soviets or the Chinese or the jihadists or you, you, whatever it might be. And in those wars and in all those years overseas, I never once believed that my, my constitution and my republic was truly in danger until this administration. And then the whole business of what the founders and the framers meant by domestic became clearer and clearer and clearer as we went farther into this process. Uh, and the clearing of Lafayette Park was one to me, one of the darkest moments that I had seen. Um, I've seen some dark moments, but those were, it was the first of June, as I recall, those were very peaceful demonstrators. And they were, the faces of those demonstrators represented, I thought the very best of America. The diversity in those faces and the backgrounds and the ages was the very best of America. And they were violently cleared out of Lafayette Park in order to make a, a smooth passage for the president of the United States to go stand in front of a church and with a Bible to be 
photograph for a constituency of his followers. Uh, at the same time, he was deciding whether he was going to employ federal troops against uh, American citizens. That's when I became, while I had been dissatisfied with the administration, that's when I became deeply concerned that the Constitution was truly at risk. And so fast forward, the election occurs, he loses the election and begins to lie about it. It's now become known as the big lie. And he's been joined in that big lie by not just large members of the electorate who are not certainly not bad people, I'm not implying that, but when you're lied to enough, you begin to believe something like the big lie pretty easily. But he's also joined by a large number of his own party who were going to vote against uh, in protest the outcome of the election when it was being certified really in an honorific way by the vice president of the United States in a symbolic uh, gesture that supports both the constitution and the electoral process of the United States. And having failed across the country in those swing states to bring any form of credible legal challenge to any aspect of the election, it then became an intent to stimulate uh, a large grouping of American followers that had come to the, the Capitol or come to the come to Washington, D.C., and then were agitated and sent down to the Capitol, where elements within that population uh, would decide to act actively assault the building of the Capitol of the United States to, to disrupt the, uh, the process of the certification of the election. Um, now, I have been in riots, I mean, really big riots. Uh, and once a riot gets kicked off, the mentality known as the mob mentality is uh, it's very dangerous and it's very combustible. And we've all seen watching with horror. We've all seen the video and we, you could all see, we could all see how this was building on itself. And in the ranks of the demonstrators, some are called insurrectionists, some are called domestic terrorists, and there are some of those in there as well lots of them, it became clear that had they gotten their hands on certain members of our electorate, and in particular, we heard them calling for Nancy, looking for Nancy Pelosi. We knew that they were attempting uh, ultimately to kill uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, we heard them actively calling for the hanging of Mike Pence because he wasn't complying with the president's illegal desire for Mike Pence to be uh, an obstacle to the counting of the of the election. <clears throat> and so think about what we have here. We have thousands of American citizens sent against the legislature. One branch of the government, the president, sends thousands of Americans against a second branch of the government, the legislature, in an intent to disrupt a constitutional process for the certification of the democratic process of the election of the president of the United States. And for the first time in my life, I suddenly realized what I had been swearing about when I swore to protect the constitution against all enemies, foreign and now domestic. And I think you're gonna see a couple of things. We're gonna be a long time before we can reconcile many of the people in that group. Uh, it's just gonna take a long time because they didn't end up this way uh, last on the 6th of uh, January and we're not gonna change their minds um, and, and the, the people that we elected to the House and to the Senate who chose to line up with Donald Trump and support the big lie um, against the reality that the president had lost the election and a president-elect was being certified that day, we're going, we're take, going to take a long time to overcome that. But we all have to decide that we want to overcome that. And uh, that's going to be the challenge for this president. And if you, and I, I suspect you did, John, I suspect many of our viewers did, if you listen to the uh, inaugural address, if there was one thread that ran throughout the entire inaugural address, it was one of the desire for unity and reconciliation and healing for all Americans. And the Americans that felt the necessity to storm the Capitol uh, didn't just wake up that morning and decide to overthrow the legislature of the United States government. 
This was a long series of events that generated that. And I'm not excusing it at all. But as we look into our souls and we look ourselves in the mirror, we've got to decide what the problems are in this country and seek the kind of unity and reconciliation that's going to be necessary, or this is going to go on for a long time. Uh, so you wanted my views on the sixth. Um, I fought in four different conflicts, never worried about the integrity of the Constitution or the safety of my government. Yet the first branch of the government, the legislature, was basically overthrown for several hours with the potential that some of them could have been tracked down and killed by domestic terrorists and insurrectionists on the 6th of January in Washington, DC. We should be damn mad about it. We should find out why it happened and people should be held accountable for this. And, and that doesn't mean we can't move forward with reconciliation because there are some people saying holding people accountable just throws fire, uh, gasoline on the fire. Look, those people had already thrown gasoline on the fire. We've got to hold people accountable because we can't permit a future uh, administration to believe that this could ever be uh, countenanced in a constitutional, liberal, democratic republic, which is what we are. Well, General Allen, I mean, final question. And it was, uh, I was reading someplace where you had said that during your, uh, your military service, you, oftentimes when you would meet with delegations, you would hand out a commemorative coin to just uh, you know, mark the occasion. And I think some years ago or several years ago, you, you switched the ritual and you, you handed out small copies of the Constitution. Um, to, you know, what, when did you start it and what was the impetus? Obviously well before January 6th. But, and, and what do you say as you hand constitutions to, uh, to visitors? Well, again, not because I expected you to ask, ask the question, but this is the copy of the Constitution that I've had on my desk. For a number of years and pulling that out those are the things that i have tabbed in it that are really important to me the uh, articles of the constitution the first second and third article the first article being about the legislature second about the executive third about the judiciary and key amendments because in the end if i was prepared to lead troops in combat and die myself to defend this it seems to me that we all ought to know a little bit about it uh, and so uh, handing out this was important to me uh, this I get in large numbers uh, just up the street at Mount Vernon. And this is now what I give as a gift on the holidays or I hand out to, to folks who are visiting me. And it's, look, if we don't understand our origins, we don't understand the system of laws ultimately that are the constitution and which create the basis then for further legislation, um, then we have no real foundation in order to tether our, be our beliefs and our behavior and our expectations for our fellow citizens. And the more we know about the promise of the Declaration of Independence, and the more we know about the, the delivery on that promise, which was the Constitution, and the more we remain, remain true to the Constitution as the body of laws that supersedes loyalty to any person or to any symbol or to any flag, the more we understand that and embrace it and live it, the greater will be our capacity to heal the divisions in our society and to move forward as a society for the common good of every single American, but more broadly to be a beacon of good in the world today. And that's why I hand that out. Great. Well, General Allen, thank you so much for your time. You've been remarkably generous. We obviously could spend about another six or seven hours chatting about it. And we would actually, what we'd like to do is uh, persuade you to come to Carbondale sometime when travel allows and visit the Midwest and we'd love to show you around Southern Illinois and have you meet with students and faculty and, and, uh, and get a sense of, uh, of life here. So if your schedule allows, we'd love to uh, entice you to the Midwest. I'd be honored. Um, Paul Simon uh, Public Policy Institute is well known uh, to us and we really appreciate the work that's done there. And uh, if anything brings you to Washington DC, please come by Brookings. Great. Thank you so much, General Allen. Thank you. My honor to be with you today. Great. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for watching another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. We'll have a video of this interview on our website tomorrow. Please look at it and show it to friends. And thank you for supporting the Institute and keeping the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thank you so much.